Okay. Thank you for the help. All right, thanks everyone. I'm honored to be here. Um, really great to be back to Apps at Cali. It's always beautiful and such an amazing place. And thank you for coming to this closing technical keynote. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, this is a, just a new project that, uh, project that I, I mean, things that I, I've really been um, just fascinated with is networking. I mean, networking has always been really fun. And web, the web browsers have always been really interesting to me. Um, and a couple of other areas. So I've just been working sort of for, for fun on this little project uh, about, you know, how can we manipulate the browser? How can we do cool stuff with networking? Um, so we're going to talk about some browser manipulation here. But first, we'll talk about NAT, or Network Address Translation. Who here is familiar with NAT? All right, most of us. Um, so NAT is Network Address Translation. Most of us have a router or uh, essentially have a router at home. I mean, most of our networks at home probably look closer to this. But essentially, <laughs> the idea of NAT is that it allows multiple devices behind a single public IP address, right? That was the, that was the primary reason that we created such a, such a protocol. And the reason for that is because we have, oh no. <laughs> that's OK, that's just the NSA. <laughs> um, <laughs> so and the reason for that is that we started running out of IP addresses. Fortunately, there's another version of IP coming out. You may have not heard of it. It's IPv5. Uh, <laughs> That quickly got superseded by IPv6, which one day, one day will come out, we hope. All right, so our networks typically look like this. All right. And we'll have our different devices, and they'll have internal IP addresses, right? When we first all got on the internet, well, many of us got on the internet at different times. Um, I remember when I first got the internet, uh, I had this box on the table, and it made really annoying sounds. And it would go, it would then dial up into some place, and I would get a public IP address that was accessible on the internet. And the problem with this is that anything that you're running, any service that you're running on your computer is then accessible by anyone else on the internet, right? Anyone can hit your IP, and if you're running Windows 95, they could send you an out of band UDP NetBIOS packet, and your computer would crash. It would fall to the ground from a single packet. They call that a denial of service. You're probably not familiar with those. They're called distributed denial of service now. You need thousands and thousands of machines all to point at one single host. But back then, you send one single packet to turn a system down. And we solved that with these routers that would create this NAT and then protect you. So any inbound traffic that hits your public IP address would essentially, your devices in the back would get protected. Um, so really, a NAT is really cool because it acts like a firewall. <laughs> So I'll go home and I practice this a lot. <laughs> and now, a while back, when we actually did dial up and we, when we didn't have routers and we had NATs, we had a public IP on our computer when we connected to the internet. And that wasn't as, um, as much of a big deal because we didn't have a ton of services that were running on our systems. Um, before I made this presentation, while, during making this presentation, I ran LSOF. It, it shows you all open files and open network, uh, network ports. And this is running on this computer right here. I just did an LSOF just to see what is listening. And I grepped for open ports, TCP and UDP. I was blown away because I consider myself uh, you know, somewhat knowledgeable on security. And like I'm, I probably keep my computer reasonably secure. I have all of these services running that I had no idea that are listening and bound to public network ports. Now, fortunately, my NAT typically protects me from outbound, you know, outsiders connecting back to any of these. But the things I'm running, like MySQL is running. I didn't realize that. Dropbox has an open port. Um, a bunch of node services, I have no idea what. Parallels keeps an open port. Cup SD, what is that? I think that's a printer thing. Printing? Um, I don't print. <laughs> I, I used Sonos once. I don't have Sonos speakers or anything. I used Sonos once 10 years ago, literally 10 years ago. I installed it. I don't have any application. There's no application Sonos running. There's no, nothing in the menu bar. And it's listening on my public. On, it's bound to every IP, bound to every interface. This is crazy. So all of these services are potential attack vectors right, into my machine. And our NAT will typically protect against outsiders who are going to attack any of these. But if you wanted to investigate it, Spotify, Better Touch Tool, Teensy, Processing, all these things are listening and have services that are running. So that's actually kind of cool. And I really want to attack some of those services. Because if we start investigating those, we're going to find attacks. We're going to find problems with these services. Just uh, in the past few months, a number of services that are running standard, uh, if you're using video conferencing applications, you are running a service, right? Whether, you, whether you're using it in that moment or not, 
even if you exit, you are still running a service in the background. So I want to attack some of those. We're not going to look at attacking any specific applications. Um, instead, we're just going to look at how can we get bypass the firewall, bypass the NAT, and actually get through. And about 10 years ago, I demonstrated something called NAT pinning, which is a simplified version of this. And it would allow an outside attacker to bypass the NAT. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But first, to understand how a NAT actually tracks multiple connections. We have all these computers behind, uh, behind your NAT. And essentially, the NATs implement something called connection tracking, as do firewalls. And what will happen is you will make an outbound connection. Let's say it's a TCP connection. You'll send a packet that goes out. You'll have your source IP and your destination IP and a source port and destination port. And your NAT and your firewall, they keep track of that in a hash table. And if they ever see a packet that comes back with all of those reversed, the source and destination ports and IP addresses are reversed, then it knows that it has to be with that connection. And it knows which computer, which machine to send it back to. Um, here, just to see connection tracking happening, essentially I'm uh, doing a TCP dump on my computer and then I'm doing TCP dump on another machine on the public internet and I'm making a connection out. And we will see essentially, uh, when I make the connection from my computer, I'm using an internal IP address. But on the destination machine, they don't see my internal IP address, it gets rewritten to the public IP address of a router. So. One, one way that we might be able to attack, essentially, I want to bypass that NAT. I want to bypass that firewall and uh, communicate with a machine that is behind that NAT. So one potential thing to look at is something called application-level gateways, or ALGs. And ALGs, I'm going to move my foot. I'm going to move another foot. Nice. <laughs> Whew, OK. Uh, and ALGs essentially allow are, are for protocols that use multiple ports. So FTP is a good example. Uh, who, who's used FTP? Who still uses it? <laughs> uh, so FTP, when you connect to an FTP server, <laughs> you'll make a connection to port 21, typically TCP port 21. And then you'll say, hey, I want, you, I want to download a file. And the way that works is you don't do that over that existing connection. You actually produce, an, you open a port. And you say, hey, connect back to me on this port. Now, when our routers came out, that stopped working. FTP actually stopped working because you would say, hey, I want you to connect back to me. And a remote host would then try to connect back on port 1234, but the router would say, I don't know why you're trying to inbound, connect on inbound 1234. I don't have that open. And I don't have DMZ or port forwarding, anything enabled. So then routers had to implement application level gateways. And what these do is essentially stateful inspection of outbound traffic from the internal, the trusted side of the network. So if I see a connection on, as a router on port 21 going out to an FTP server and I say, hey, connect back to me on 1234, then your router will say, oh, I know, this looks like FTP traffic. So I'm going to open 1234 and redirect it back to my client so their FTP connection will work. Now, there are passive modes and other modes to bypass this um, issue, but not every protocol supports those. And so RFCs are great. This is what I read. <laughs> great bedtime reading, if you want to really understand how a protocol works. And now an RFC is not necessarily how the protocol is implemented, right? That's how it's supposed to be implemented. And RFCs themselves, right? The, we're all human, we all make errors, so there are errors in RFCs. They're not, they don't necessarily cover every corner case, but they're really good to understand how, what, how, should, this protocol, how should this protocol work? And then implementation is another story. Uh, you know, let me try one. I will open up this again because I do have some notes in here. I'll make sure I'm giving you guys all the, all the proper data. Now, in 2010, I demonstrated this thing called NAT pinning. And NAT pinning essentially bypassed your router. And the way it worked is that you would visit my website, say, a malicious website. And when you're doing that, um, excuse me, all right, then you would, you would then connect to my web server, right? You download some HTML and some JavaScript. And then that JavaScript would then make a connection to a ALG protocol, something like FTP. Except your browser, if you just do an FTP connection, then it'll say, hey, I'm connecting to this FTP protocol. But instead, we would say, no, we're not connecting to FTP. We're connecting to HTTP. We would actually create an iframe and a form. We'd create a form to an FTP port. In my case, I was using IRC. And specifically, that was because it's a new line-based protocol. So if I make a form and I post to port 6667, which is IRC, then I can actually send IRC commands like, uh, connect to the server or send a private message, which is weird because my browser doesn't know the protocol, the IRC protocol. However, the way HTTP works is that it's a new line based protocol. Every command you send is on a new line, right? You send a post slash HTTP 1.0. Then you send a host colon whatever. Then you go through all your HTTP headers until you get to your post data. 
Now your post data, the attacker has full control over, right? I can say, I want you to post whatever I want. And then there I can put IRC commands. Now you connect to an IRC server and it's like, I don't know what post means. And it ignores that command. It says, I don't know what host colon means. It ignores that. I don't know what user agent means. It ignores that until it gets to the post data. And then it says, oh, my username is Sammy. Join this channel, message these people. And now your browser as a client, just visiting my website, just connects you to an IRC server and send a bunch of messages on my behalf, which is pretty crazy. Now IRC also, it has ALG, which is pretty cool. So IRC, if you've ever done a DCC chat or a DCC file send, it's similar to FTP where you're saying, hey, connect back to me on this IP on this port. And routers will then support that. So they say, hey, I'm gonna support you connecting back and I'll open port 1234 so this DCC file will be able to get sent. And by sending a DCC command, then what will happen is your router will open that port back up. But if I'm a malicious actor and I say, I want you to connect back to me on port 22, your router is gonna open port 22 and point it back to your computer. And all you did as a victim is visit my website. So I've then opened up a port back to you. Now it didn't immediately work. And the reason is because there are these uh, ports that are blocked in most browsers, um, 21, 22, 667. But at the time, I found there was an interesting way to bypass this. And the way TCP and UDP work is their ports are 16 bits long. So you can only fit up to 65,535. But what if we connect to a port that's greater than 65,535? So let's say we connect to 65,537. What happens? Well, ultimately, the browser will look through its port list of illegal ports and say, oh, I support 65537, even though that's not a legitimate port. Then it passes it to your TCP IP stack, and that truncates it to 16 bits, which removes the top, the high bit, and now you're left with port 2. <laughs> which in, in this case would be fine, but let's say, or port one actually, I'm sorry, 65537 would be port one. Uh, so then it gets your IP stack and you get a SOC, adder, you know, SOC address structure. And in C, there's no such thing as like 65537, it just goes to port one. And now you've bypassed that. So that's pretty cool. And this is an example, just uh, doing it in C code. We can see if I add 65536 plus 1357 in a 16-bit uint, Ultimately, it was going to print 1 through 37, not whatever 65,536 plus 1337 is. And then here is actual what would happen if we wanted to connect to IRC. We say user, Nick, etc. And that, that's an IRC connection to private to send a message. And then here's HTTP, right? This is what an HTTP connection looks like. We're talking HTTP, not HTTPS, of course. So you can then implement this in a little bit of JavaScript very, pr pretty quickly. You create a, you create a form. You post to a server on 6667 plus 65,536, um, and then you send some form data. And the form data is a DCC chat or DCC file send, and you say, hey, connect back to me on port 22. And now your router has just opened port 22 back up to you. The problem is this didn't work. And the reason was because in a DCC chat, you need to include the local IP address. You need to include your IP address. And as the attacker, I don't know your internal IP. I need to know your internal IP address. So how do I get that? Has anyone heard of Live Connect? Good. So Live Connect came out in around 2010, and it was a feature in Firefox that allowed you to access Java in JavaScript without running an applet, which is kind of crazy. Um, but with Live Connect, then what you could do is you can actually access things like Java.net. And Java.net then allowed you to grab the local IP address of any interface, at which point it, you would send it back to me, and then we'd fill in this DCC chat and I'd have your internal IP and your router would be like, oh, that makes sense. This looks like a totally legitimate DCC IRC connection. It's on the right port. It's sending the right messages. It's all new line based. Let me absolutely open it up. And it worked and it was beautiful. You can then connect to any port you wanted on any victim. After demonstrating this, they, they quickly resolved all of this. So here's the actual uh, updated code you run uh, and that will, that will all work. The problem is none of this works today, right? They fixed all of this. There's no more live connect in browsers, which is a good thing. Um, there's the overflow technique no longer works. That's a good thing. So you can't overflow and you can't connect to those ports. So I wanted to see, is this still possible? Um, so I started looking at NetFilter and NetFilter is Linux's IP stack. So just the nice thing about Linux is open source so we can see exactly how it works. So going through, I made this little spreadsheet of the bunch of services that the Linux NetFilter supports ALGs for. And I essentially took all the protocols here and then I said, okay, which, which ones do Chrome block? Because I think that might be kind of interesting. Um, because I'm looking specifically for things that aren't blocked because I can't use that bypass, that sort of port underflow anymore. And one of these that are interesting is SIP. So SIP is like FTP. Um, 
And the nice thing about SIP is that it's also new line based, right? So you're sending a message and you're sending a new line. Really, it's a carriage return and a new line, but whatever. Uh, and with, F, uh, with SIP, you're sending, I want to send a register, and then you send a bunch of commands which look just like HTTP. So we can potentially do the same attack. So we tried this out, and I created a new form, injected the same thing, injected the same packet, but this time it's now a SIP packet. It's a legitimate SIP packet, but it didn't work. And it fails because the incorrect IP. I don't know the local IP, and I, I can't use the live connect thing. So I started looking, is there a way that we can actually get the, sub, the IP address? And just to make sure, how are we on time? I know we Keep going, don't worry. Oh, okay. okay, sorry, another two hours is good? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so how can we get the LAN IP? And started looking at diff different protocols, and there's something kind of cool in web browsers today called WebRTC. And WebRTC is real-time communication. It allows audio and video and data messaging across peers, so you can do peer-to-peer -peer communication. However, if you're behind a really restrictive NAT, you need to use something like Turn or Stun to figure out what your type of NAT is or whether you need to relay that information. So ICE and Stun and Turn have this really cool mechanism that's now built into the browser that you can say, hey, what is my NAT and what is my IP address and what is my public and internal IP? And you will actually get your internal IP address. This is beautiful. This means we can get the internal IP address. So I was very excited. This attack was working. And, uh, Unfortunately, as I was making this presentation, it stopped working. And so I apologize, everyone. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, but I, I kept looking. So I was like, all right, it, it stopped working, but can we do something about this? And the reason it stopped working is because people realize it's kind of an issue to actually reveal public, uh, local IP address. So they came up with a clever workaround where they actually give you an MDNS or Bonjour address, which is useless to me as an attacker because I can't, I can't use that in the SIP packet. I need an IP address. So this attack will not work. So what can we do instead? Um, well, let's see actually how, a, uh, how TCP and IP work. Like we're gonna connect, we're gonna make two, a couple connections here. First, I'm gonna take an IP that I know on my network is up and I'm gonna connect to a port. And that port is closed. And I send a SYN packet and what happens is I get an RST packet immediately back. Now I'm gonna connect to a port that I know is open port 80. So I connect, I send a SYN back and I immediately get a SYNAC back. Now we'll try connecting to a host where it is not on the network. And we'll send an ARP request because we actually don't know the MAC address of that device. And we're just waiting. We're just waiting for something to happen. So what's interesting about this is that whether the port was closed or not, if the host is on, it's going to respond instantly. So maybe we can use that and use that essentially as timing information. So what if we make an image and then we have an on, on load and on error event on that image, and that image is to an IP address, maybe an IP address of a potential router, like 192.168.0.1, and then we connect to a port. It doesn't matter whether it's open or closed, because if it's up, it's gonna respond instantly, either with a SYNAC or an RST. If it doesn't exist, it's gonna take longer than a second, so I can just say after a second, I know that host is not up. And what if we do that for every primary router address that you have, every possible dot one address, like every 10 dot whatever dot zero dot whatever, and every 192.168 dot whatever dot one, then you can send all of these images instantly, and whichever one responds immediately, you know that's the subnet they're on. Then what if you perform the same attack, the same timing attack, and say, okay, I know they're on 192.168.0, but I don't know their IP address. So then you replay this 255 times for the rest of the 255 IPs. You might get 20 different responses back, but whichever is the fastest is gonna be you, because you don't even need to leave your interface. So if you don't even leave your interface, you instantly get a response, and now you know that is the, the IP address, the internal IP address of that user. So now we can perform this attack. Um, here's an example. So this is just running the code. It hits every, po every possible internal router, and then it, every possible uh, IP on that subnet, and we just validate it does, in fact, get the right IP address. So that's pretty cool. So now we, now we can actually do this on modern browsers, and this works on every browser. So let's test this SIP packet again. Let's put the actual internal IP address, and then let's send it off. Unfortunately, it still doesn't work. and I, I don't know why. And I guess I just don't understand routers. I don't know why, why these, how these ALGs work. So I took my router, and when you don't know how something works, I, I highly suggest you open it up, and you see what's inside. So I opened up my router, and we're gonna quickly go over how, um, this is not a hardware talk, so we're not gonna talk too much about hardware, but I do wanna tell you just the tools that I use. So if you're interested, you can also use these tools. Um, I use my phone, I'm, uh, I apologize, I'm embarrassed, it's the wrong slide. 
That's better. <laughs> OK, that's better, much better. So I actually use my phone quite a bit. Um, I use the camera and I use the flash. Uh, so whenever I'm opening something up, I take a lot of pictures. And I also use the flash because that will allow me to look to follow traces. So if you take a circuit board, you can put the flash underneath, and it will give you a really nice outline of all the copper traces. Um, I'll then take the pictures of the front and the back, and then I'll put them in like pixel meter or Photoshop or whatever. And then I'll use transparency, alpha transparency, so that I can see both sides, um, and then follow routes of, of uh, connectors, of nets. Um, I'll take pictures of all the, uh, all the chips. I'll look up any public data sheets, and then I'll read those data sheets. Because typically what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get at firmware. Because once I have firmware, then I can reverse engineer that. And if we're reading the data sheets, then we can see, OK, how can I dump the firmware? Can I access debug ports, et cetera? Uh, these are the types of probes I use. They're super, super useful, because they allow you to connect to really, really tight leads like that. Uh, what else? Let's see, we have different chips. so. Um, really just pulling the data sheets, finding out what, what are the different lines for the different chips. I use a logic analyzer. I love Celier. Their software is really great. Sometimes uh, I'll be dealing with chips that have bootloader protection or bootloader mechanisms that prevent you from connecting as a debug, as a debugger, or prevent you from extracting firmware. Um, I recently did a talk at Supercon Hackaday, uh, which is more of a hardware thing, uh, where I demonstrated new techniques to bypass bootloader protection. So if you are dealing with a chip that won't allow you to connect a debugger, uh, you might want to check that talk out because it talks about new techniques to bypass those protections. Um, but let's say we've been able to actually extract the firmware or we've been able to download the firmware online, assuming it's not encrypted. Well, let's take that firmware. So I grabbed this firmware from the, I think, Netgear website um, for my router or for one of my routers I was testing. Uh, I used Binwalk to then try to find any binaries that were inside. Uh, in this case, I found a SquashFS uh, root file system. Uh, extracted that SquashFS file system. I won't go too much to that. And now I'm pretty much just looking, are there any interesting files? Um, and we know FTP is a common ALG. So I don't understand how the application level gateway works. I thought I did. I, I was incorrect. So now I want to see, can I let's reverse engineer and see what this is working? None of these files look that interesting. So let's start grepping files for FTP. Uh, one of these actually looks kind of interesting. That's tdts.ko. What's specifically interesting about that is I know ko means kernel object. So we're actually looking at a Linux file system here. And uh, if I strings that, t that kernel object, there's something called FTP decoder. So that sounds pretty interesting. So we'll take a look at that. Uh, I thought this would be a good time to learn how to use this tool, uh, Jahidra? Gidra? Gidra? God, OK. So, I thought it'd be good. I typically use Ida Pro, but I thought it'd be uh, good to use this open source reverse engineering tool. This is from the NSA, if you're not familiar with it. Um, and after the NSA actually released this open source multi million, multi million line reverse engineering tool, Microsoft also had a response. They open sourced Calculator. <laughs> so, like, yeah, we got you, NSA. So, using this tool, we can pull up this KO. And then we start looking at, all right, so we see this FTP decode. So maybe there's a pattern here. So I search for decode, and we find some other decoders, like SIP decode, which is the kind of thing we're trying to decode. And I'm like, why didn't the SIP packet that I wanted to open up a port, it didn't work. So what can we do? So I'll just keep, keep looking around. And then I see invite. Invite is a SIP command. And then it does a string case compare. It grabs this, this string called invite, which is a SIP command. That's typically the beginning of a SIP packet. And then it grabs the data, the data portion of the packet, the, of the TCP packet. And it does a string compare, and it says, if, they're not, if the beginning of the packet doesn't start with invite, I'm going to drop this. So what that tells me is that the reason the SIP packet is not going to work is because if you're trying to do an HTTP post of a SIP packet, well, a post is going to start with post, slash, whatever, host, colon, user agent, colon. And then you'll get to the post data. Well, once you're at the post data, that's, that string case is going to fail. So the only way to get this to work is to have invite at the very beginning of the packet. And the problem is you can't, there is no invite HTTP command. That's not a real command. So this, this attack will no longer work. So I was thinking, OK, maybe there's a way I can do arbitrary packet injection within a browser. So I started looking at like the Chrome experiments just to see, are there any protocols, any weird features I can use in there? Uh, I didn't find anything there. We started looking at the source code. I started grepping for different sockets. Uh, what kind of sockets are being generated by the browser? Maybe we can abuse something there. Started looking at the w3.org because there's excellent documentation there. Uh, I somehow stumbled on this page, which was actually the worst documentation I've ever seen. What is topic? <laughs> Ex dot 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 explanation. What is topic used for? Dot 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 explanation. 
Um, so then I started looking at what are some of the protocols that the browser supports? HTTP, HTTPS, there's HTTP2, Spidey, Quick, ICE, WebRTC, Turn, Turn, Stun, MDNS. Started playing with all of those, and none of those really allowed me to, to do too much. Um, although I was playing with Stun, and I found that Stun allows you Stun allows you to figure out what kind of NAT you're behind, but it also allows authentication. So you can say, oh, this is my username, this is my password. And I was just playing around with it and found that you can actually use anything as the username. That means you can do a 100-byte username or 200-byte username and any file or any uh, character you want in there. So I just started creating giant, weird stun packets. I, I don't know why, just to see what would happen. And essentially, that, that was working fine. So I just had a username that was really, really, really long with new lines and all sorts of stuff. And then I was wondering, well, what happens if that's so long that it no longer fits in an IP packet or it no longer fits the MTU size of your Ethernet header? It's going to have to fragment that packet into two packets. Well, what if I can figure out what your MTU size is and what your IP fragmentation size is? Can I make the packet so long that then it stops, sends off that one IP packet, creates a new IP packet, and the beginning of that packet is invite? Maybe. The answer is yes. Yes, you can do that. <laughs> um, so that's pretty cool. Uh, what? Let's see where we are. Oh, yeah. OK, cool. Um, so essentially, normally you have an Ethernet layer, then an IP layer, and then you have an IP, I mean, ICMP or TCP or UDP. Now, this was really cool, and it worked for UDP. The problem with the way that ALGs work is that if you're doing a UDP SIP connection, it will only allow you to then connect back to UDP sockets. Um, if you're doing TCP, then it will allow you to do TCP. Uh, the problem with turn and stun is that those are UDP. Actually, I'm sorry, stun is specifically UDP. So I can only then connect back to UDP ports, which is cool because you can t connect back to things like Monjour or MDNS on port 5353. You can connect back to Bind or TNS servers on port 53. But most of the interesting protocols are TCP. So can we do this with TCP? So what if we just send a really long post? This is uh, the way my post, the post in my browser, my Chrome browser, normally looks. I post my website. Here's the data. I bolded the data that I control. And I control the cookies, I control the refer a little bit, and I post, and I control the URI that I'm posting to. Um, and if I'm doing an actual post, then I also control all this post data at the end, which really doesn't have much uh, size limit. I believe the previous, uh, a, a previous speaker was also talking about there was, a, I believe, an 8 kilobyte post size limit, but that's plenty for our, for our needs. So if we actually break this up, what if we do this? We post all this data. I don't know what happened with that circle. I think I just got weird in Photoshop, and then I send an invite or a register command. The problem is I don't actually know where the boundary is, right? I don't know their Ethernet MTU size. I don't know their TCP fragmentation or their IP fragmentation size. Uh, I don't know their TCP uh, MSU size. But what we can do is we can do some tests, and we can automate this. So all we do is the victim visits our website, and then we send a really long packet. Then on our server, we're sending it. We have a sniffer running and see where does it break. At that break point, we now know the size of their MTU and the size of their IP packet and where their TCP packet will break. And then we can take all that information and use that to together, entirely automated. So they visit us. We figure out they're sending a couple of packets. We're figuring out what kind of NAT they're on. We're figuring out where the packet breaks up. We then send a next packet with the exact number of bytes that we need in the first post. We're really sending a single post, right? But their IP stack has to break it up into two packets because it's too long. Once it's too long, the next packet is a valid SIP packet, at which point you then opened up the port in that. And then you repeat that for 65,534 ports, and you've now opened every single port on their machine, on their router, back to them. You do this for UDP and TCP, and now you have a full connection to anything running on their machine, um, which is pretty neat. Here's a, uh, pretty much what's happening is, all right, thanks. Yeah. So the victim, and the, and the beauty is the user does nothing, right? They get no pop-ups. All they're doing is they're visiting a website. And not even necessarily a website. It could just be some JavaScript that's running on somebody else's website. Um, so if anyone wants to do a banner exchange, I'd love to throw a banner on your website. <laughs> so this allows arbitrary both TCP and UDP packet injection um, and allows you to pretty much connect. Here's a, a proof of concept. I've included the source at the end, uh, but essentially we can uh, automatically discovers the IP address um, and then sends a couple of packets. I found that Firefox, uh, compared to all other browsers, will actually slightly change one, one part of this packet. Um, it has this, like, between the post 
between the HTTP headers and the post, there's this WebKit URI form uh, value, and that will sometimes change a couple bytes. So you just have to send it a couple times, and then it'll, it will succeed. All of the browsers, it's always a fixed thing. Additionally, some, some browsers like IE10 don't support WebRTC. Safari doesn't support the WebRTC, the stun local IP address. All the timing attack stuff bypasses all of that and works on every single modern browser um, across multiple operating systems, which is, which is quite, quite cool. And uh, yeah, great success. And, and I'm so happy the GIF still works. So it's very cool. So thank you so much. I uh, appreciate your time and uh, listening to this uh, fun technical talk. I'd be happy to chat with anyone and answer questions. Oh, that blue. Why not? I think Richard has come to the conclusion that he's just going to give me the mic at the beginning, at the end of uh, every talk. Um, this, uh, unless I'm completely ruining my own understanding of uh, server-side request forgery, this sounds like you've basically done that, um, but inverted it against the client. Um, uh, it's a very simplified. I guess I don't understand. What, what is, how does server-side request forgery No, no, no. Work? I'm not saying that that's, I'm, I'm saying that this seems like this attack is kind of analogous to that. Okay. Um, in that instead it's the. Um, oh, it, I see. It's the client kind of. Yeah. It's the, it's the site that's essentially forging requests from the user's browser. Yeah. I mean, it, it's amazing, right? We have these like extremely, extremely powerful uh, code execution applications running on our systems and it's our web browser. And web browsers are amazing, right? They're extremely powerful. I think what's really fun and what's really interesting to me about stuff like this is that there's no real vulnerability here, right? We're, we're not exploiting anything. These are just the way the protocols work. We're just kind of saying, okay, we're gonna take some features of this protocol and some features of this protocol and mash them together. And we're really just you know, using them in ways that they weren't necessarily intended. And that produces some interesting side effects that we can then, you know, as an attacker use. Um, so it's kind of cool because I, I don't really like, I don't want to point fingers at, at any person and we don't have to because no one's doing anything wrong, right? Everyone's just following their RFCs and implementing things correctly and we're able to, you know, gain some privilege based off that. Yeah, so the last time I did that, a whole protocol died. Um, <laughs> so I'm assuming, like, do you have any f potential foresight into um, what might be necessary to kind of preempt this? Uh, well, to yeah, kind of preempt stopping the HTTP, class? you know, the, the, the thing that is, specific that allows all of this is the fact that we're talking about new line based protocols, right? Like HTTP, like SIP, like FTP. So if you just stop new line, not, I'm not saying we should not have new line based protocols, but that would be a simple solution is if we enforce TLS, but there's other troubles with TLS. Like how are you supposed to talk TLS to your router, right? If you're talking about sort of a consumer device, we both like, you're not going to be able to get a certificate for 192.168.0.1. Um, so I think we need to solve that problem. Um, before we can really entirely get rid of HTTP. Hi, thanks for a really interesting talk. Um, have you looked into whether UPnP is similarly exploitable? Because that's been a I've played a, a little bit. Yeah, UPnP is a little challenging just because it's these it's uh, these big SOAP requests that you're sending, um, and that's just it's just awful to use SOAP. Uh, but I played with it a little bit. But I found uh, that was one of the protocols I was looking at. Um, ultimately, I found that this was more successful. I did not find I did not find any attacks in UPnP when I was looking. Uh, but I'd definitely be interested to hear if you if you found anything because I definitely, I de absolutely you can do cool stuff with UPnP, especially if you're on a LAN and you can do it as other people. So even if you're on say a corporate firewall with like a managed switch that is not allowing ARP spoofing, you can still do probably do things like spoof IP, right? Spoof internal IP traffic to your router as a UPnP device, as a UPnP client and say, hey, I want you to open this other port open to this other device over here. So I'm sure there's some interesting attacks there. <laughs> Great conference. <laughs> uh, I, I, I love AppSec Cali, so every time I can make it here, it's always been it's always been really fun. And I can't always catch the talks, but it's great that uh, they publish them online. So I always appreciate that. So I used to run a, a big firewall team in in Cisco. Um, okay. And um, did you try this on any uh, sort of like what they call, like not you know vendor independent, but a commercial or enterprise grade? Firewalls which have protection against uh, NAT, well, because you're doing uh, NAT hole punching essentially, and uh, they actually do a lot of anomaly detection against that. Also, session tracking. Um, I'm just I, curious. I, I, did, I did use it on an enterprise. Uh, I did not use it on Cisco. Um, no, no, it's fine. But you yeah. use it on an enterprise, uh, you know, because yes. Netgear is not necessarily. I mean, it's a router, not necessarily a firewall. I'm just kind of curious because the reason I'm saying that isn't necessarily say Net, Netgear is bad. Use something else, but just to say that. 
there's so little uh, money. Like, you know, everybody in this room, right, probably uses Netgear or something, you know, and mm -hmm. if they want to bet Best Buy and if in a firewall was $50 more expensive, they wouldn't buy it. Sure. And that's terrible. And, well, and I think the biggest, uh, in my opinion, the biggest walk away from your presentation is that people confuse routers with firewalls and, and, and they don't pay for it. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't think that's, that's anyone's fault. I mean, it's hard to... It's hard to read the back of a box and know that what you're getting for 50 more dollars, um, and you don't necessarily need money, right? You can use PFSense if you want to, uh, if you want some real protection. You can disable ALG. Um, you can do some pretty cool stuff. I was able to perform this attack on an enterprise uh, firewall. The reason I use things like the Netgear is because it's something we're all quite familiar with, right? Well, we all you, have something. because you were able to uh, essentially by bypass the bootloader. There's a lot of information you were able to extract, which makes it a little harder on a. A real firewall. I mean, I'd say uh, enterprise level high firewall. I'd be curious to know, I for example, Palo Alto networks. I'd be curious to see if you can actually replicate this attack on a Palo Alto box. Sure. The, the attacks that I was demonstrating on the hardware are ARM based attacks. I was specifically defeating bootloader on ARM chips. ARM chips aren't, I mean, every phone in this, in this room is based on ARM, yeah. right? It doesn't matter if it's consumer or industrial. So the specific hardware based attacks, uh, those, are going to be, those are going to be quite effective, I believe. Um, uh, yeah, again, I, I did a talk at Super, uh, Supercon specifically targeting how can we def uh, defeat bootloader protections as well as hardware protections because ultimately when you're doing something like a bootloader or debug protection, what's happening is you're saying essentially you have all these transistors that are just doing the same logic that you're doing in software, but they're hardware level. So they're saying, I'm a transistor, I'm going to wait for a clock cycle, and then I'm going to say, oh, is this debug flag on? Is this fuse burned? And all you're doing is doing at that point I'm doing clock glitching or voltage glitching. Mm -hmm. If you can remove voltage enough power that that transistor can't perform that actual check, mm -hmm. uh, that memory won't be able to update because there's not enough power for that microsecond, literally a microsecond, uh, to say, oh yeah, this check is enabled. It'll bypass that. And that will work uh, in, in, in various types of devices. Um, but happy to chat about that further. Uh, just a quick question. Um, how long did it take you to discover this vulnerability? That honestly, you, you honestly this is, well, it's a, co a combination of things, as you saw. Um, I mean, I work on and off on this kind of stuff just over the years. I mean, in 2010, I was the initial demonstration of, like, something similar. Um, and then maybe just in the past two years, I started playing, playing around with this again because uh, I think I just wanted, I've been doing a lot of hardware stuff, and I wanted to jump back into something that, um, you know, I miss some of the network network stuff, so I want to play around with that again. So uh, on and off for the last two years. What's next for you, Sammy? What are you working on? Um, right now, I'm working on. Uh, uh, right now, I'm specifically working on uh, a, a USB condom. If you're familiar with the, there's these juice jacking attacks. You're not supposed to be plugging in your phone or into a public USB. Um, and they sell these USB condoms, and the, those cut off the data lines. So you only have those power power lines available. The problem with all the USB condoms I've seen is they're all opaque. What's inside? How do you know it's actually a USB condom and it's not doing something else malicious? Um, so I'm creating a transparent USB condom that, that has the power lines running through. Um, the problem is that, uh, so really what I'm working on is something called a sputtering device uh, uh, because I want to sputter something called ITO, indium tenoxide. It's a transparent conductor because ultimately it's actually not a USB condom. It's actually going to transparently conduct those data lines and then have an antenna. But I don't need to see it. I just want it to be transparent. Um, but it's really hard to work with this ITO, so I've been working on a sort of vacuum chamber sputtering thing. That's my current project. <laughs> well, you know, we, we always support, you know, safe, safe computing. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Awesome. Thank you. Appreciate it. I think it's a fabulous end to a fabulous conference. What do you guys think, right? Yeah, great conference. Thank you. Thank you.